that we're trying to explain the difference between, say, the European perspective and the U.S. perspective. But within the Europeans' perspective, you guys understand that even within them, there are different extremes, right? So and I'm not going to give them labels, I'm just going to say A or B. And then here, the U.S. is on the opposite side. So that's why we use the terms liberal and conservative. This is why you need to understand them, that they're different. But you do know that these definitions change all the time. Liberal in 1800, not the same as liberal in 1900, and totally not the same as liberal in 2000. Go ahead. Liberal just means more, more government. That's what it means today. Liberal in 1800 was the exact opposite. It meant less government. What about liberal in 1900? <laughs> okay. <laughs> what I will say is technically, Liberal means, if you look in the dictionary, it means open to change. Okay? And conservative, which is a super easy one, I'm just going to say conserve, right? Conserve. Conservative, this means wanting to keep the status quo. And so, obviously, if those are the actual differences, if these are the definitions, Clearly, they have to change over time, right? Because if everybody is a monarch, then the guys who want to keep monarchy would be conservatives. The guys who want to get rid of monarchy would be liberals. Well, what's the next step for monarchy? Remember, we talked about this. Do you guys remember? It goes from monarchy, and then it goes... Aristocracy. Aristocracy, the aristoi, right? Aristoi means the best. Generally, it's when the parliaments are ruling. The aristoi, the best, right? Well, the aristoi, the aristocracy, are liberals compared to the monarchs, right? But who takes over the aristocracy? Democracy. Democracy, demos, the people. So those who support democracy are liberals to the aristocracy. But aren't they also liberals to the monarchs? Monarchs are conservative to the aristocracy, but the aristocracy are conservative to the democracy. Here's the crazy one. What about anarchy? And this would be radicals. And I don't know if I explained what that meant here. Did I explain that in this class? I know I did here. Yeah, you did. An anarchy just means no government. What it means is that every individual is his own government. But radicalism means that you're changing government outside of the system. Do we have radicalism in the United States? We do, but not really. Radicals are the ones that kill the leader, right? They have revolutions. That's radicalism. Because you don't go through. We might have reform, which is you want change, but how do we get reform in the United States? You vote them out, right? But that means you're using the existing system. Okay, go ahead. What were you going to say, Joey? And then I'm going to ask Lynette because she's got this question in mind. Go ahead. Just do like arguments in there. No, it's okay. Please do um, it. I was under the assumption that radical meant abrupt, like very fast change in a year. Okay. Um, it's not a bad definition, but it's, it would be technically accurate. Reform is to change. Okay. Radical, what you might be conflating the term is revolution. Revolution is a radical change, right? It's also abrupt and almost always outside of the system. But radical, if you have a radical idea, that means that you have an idea that requires you to go outside of the existing system. If you're a monarch and you're an aristocrat and you say, I think people should be able to vote based off of their family heritage and not just because you're a royal, that's actually kind of a radical idea if you force it, usually you kill the king. And in fact, that's what they did in England, right? They, they knocked on Charles I's door, and they said, you can no longer be king because you violated our rights, the rights of the aristocracy, and they cut his head off. Big civil war followed. 
This is not democracy. It was aristocracy that's doing it. So they're radicals. Democracy. The Americans were radical, weren't they? When we send the letter to King George III and say, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are endowed by the Creator with certain and rights, you're not protecting them. You Government exists to protect those rights. If you don't protect them, you either change or you get kicked out. You don't change, and so now we're breaking, we're declaring our independence from you. That's a radical system. We're going outside of those rules. So we were radicals. But once you're a Democrat, in other words, once you are into democracy where you vote for changes, the only way that you can be a radical is if you try to do something outside the system. Does this make sense? The key here, liberal, conservative, the definitions totally change. What would be more liberal than a Democrat? Go to anarchy, but really? Is that more liberal or is it actually just radical? Okay, so, Lynette, you're shaking your head. I was so sure walking in today. <laughs> Are you worried about what your answer is? Yeah, I was so sure about okay, my answer. Your answer's right. Cool. Your answer's okay. right. This isn't wrong. Why did how did I how did my how did I confuse you? Don't you? You gotta go change. You're right. I don't see where your answer is. Okay, you're right. You're right. Okay, pull them out. You're right. Okay, good. Now give them all to me so I know that. So why weren't you? What did I say? The definitions changed. Well, in 1900. Now, if we had the United States, what would the answer be? The United States. The United States. Right? The United States would be more liberal in 1900. In 1900, who is liberal and who is conservative? What does it mean to be conservative? Well, we've got the three. We've got the king, we've got the aristocracy, we've got the democracy. The king would definitely be conservative. Who else would be conservative? Aristocracy. Where is democracy? They're liberal, right? So what was the United States? Democracy. In fact, how many true democracies were in Europe? England? Not yet. Close. Not yet. You did not have everybody being able to vote in England in 1900. It wasn't until closer to 1915, basically to World War I. More people did. By 1870s, more people voted. In 1800, there's nobody voting except the people that have land. What they did is they reduced the property requirements. And so by doing that, you expand the number of people that can have voting rights. Where was France? Back and forth and back and forth. They had a king, but their local stuff was increasingly more voting. So, and sometimes they were conservative, and sometimes they were on the liberal side. They kept going back and forth, but generally, they were behind England. Where was Germany? Germany, we talked about this, remember? Kaiser. Yeah, they had the Kaiser, who was the emperor, you know, Caesar. Think Kaiser, Caesar, like the czar, same way. But, and they had a wonderful constitution where everybody voted on everything. But did the votes matter? No. You know, in the end, they could only advise the Kaiser. The Kaiser decided whatever he wanted to do. And so that's, that's conservative. What about the czar in Russia? No even pretend voting in Russia. Right? It's one of the reasons why they had a revolution, because they had no movement. The point here is that Europe was not one thing. It, it's never been one thing. It's one of the problems when you read at the very beginning of world history in Western Europe, and they talk about the Europeans taking over the Americas as if Europe was one thing. It never was. Not even the Spanish were one thing. The missionaries were different from the conquistadors, who were different from the traders, who were different from the explorers. It's different, but even on a national level, Europe has differences of ideology. This seems confusing, but it's actually not. 
in terms of politics, one person rules, a few people rule, many people rule, everybody except one. We use terms like liberty, people who vote for liberty, what they mean is they want to have most people having a voice, that's what they mean by liberty. Order, who people say, well, I don't want everybody to vote, because then the ditch digger can vote, the poop scooper can vote, and they're going to be voting for crazy things. Only the intelligent, only the best should be able to vote. That's aristocracy. Monarchy, autocracy, I know I'm going to make it right. Again, Aristotle talked about these things 2,500 years ago. Aristotle and Plato both. Who's the best possible government, he said? The best possible government. The people? No. Is that a trick question? No. I mean, it, it will be when you explain it, but it's not. The best government. <laughs> a noble monarch. Somebody who is really good as a king, because then there's no inefficiency. He wants to get it done, he does it. That's the best form of government. What's the worst form of government? A bad monarch. It's true, it's the worst, because he has some evil in mind, he doesn't. There's no checks against him. And because of the possibility of the evil monarchy, we, we temper it, and that's why you have the aristocracy. The aristocracy is not as efficient as a, no, as an, uh, a monarchy. But it can be good, Especially if they're noble, if they really are the best. But on the other hand, what happens if they all become corrupt? Then it's going to be not quite as bad as the noble, as the uh, tyrant, but close. So democracy is right in the middle. It's it's settling. It's not the best form of government, but it's much less likely to have a tyranny of the majority, which is what you have to have, a tyranny of the majority. And so since that's less likely, we settle for democracy. You don't get as much done. It's constantly inefficient. When you hear people saying, yeah, we should get rid of these rules. I, I wish that those other people would just go away and this, whatever the politician is, could just simply do it. What do we call it when he just simply does it? We, we call that monarchy, and we don't believe in that in the United States. Constitutionalism, the checks and balances, the whole point is to make it really inefficient, to slow you down. So if you're a bad guy, it's hard for you to do bad things. If you're a good guy, on the other hand, if you're a good guy, it's hard for you to do the good things. But that's the price of democracy. If we could be assured that we had one good guy every single time, the noble monarch would be best. best. But we can't. We don't have that assurance. That makes sense? That's the political system. Well, the fact is... That's politics. Conservatives, liberals, they change over time. We also have conservative and liberals on different aspects of it. And so when I talk about economics, this is a different spectrum. It's not the same as talking about politics. One leader, a few leaders. Economics is about whether the government is going to be involved with it or not. If there's no government involved that's left, we call laissez-faire. Private enterprise. People get to do whatever they want to do. Right? And the consumers determine who wins and who doesn't. If you have the government regulating and controlling everything, this is essentially communism, where the government owns everything. There is no private property. That's the extreme, the vast extreme. The government owns everything, no private property. So that would be on the far right, which is ironic and all sorts of things, but I won't tell you why. But that's the spectrum. Yes, go ahead. It says all government involved in Yes. 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 It's funny because that's not what we think of it, is it? Because the definitions change over time. So Adam Smith comes up with this idea called wealth of nations, where the government doesn't get involved at all. And he is called a liberal. So in 1800, we could talk about classical liberal economic theory. Today, if I'm talking about conservative economic theory, where do I fall? I'm not this stuff. Because definitions change. The, what Adam Smith was reacting against was mercantilism, where the government basically determined who's going in and who's going out. We don't really have mercantilism today. We have free market, which is really a liberal argument. No government involved. 
definitions change. And so this is not what it means today. If I say someone is an economic conservative, I actually mean he doesn't want any government involved. If I say he's an economic liberal, I mean that he wants to have lots of government involved. But, but that's changed, right? Why would it change? I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but if liberal means to change, and if Adam Smith was making the argument that you have no government involved, and he's in the past, if you want to keep that, what would you be? Conservative. You would be conservative. The reason why they're called economic conservatives is that our tradition in the United States is to have laissez-faire, less government involvement. That's our tradition, so we want to keep that. Does that make sense? And the people that want to increase the government would be liberals. They want to change. The concept of economic of a liberal and conservative, these definitions change all the time. So you have to be a little bit clearer. When we say classical liberal economics, that's what we're talking about, Adam Smith. When we say modern economics, then you actually mean a conservative who wants to keep that old Adam Smith idea. Confusing, but it's not. It's not confusing if you think about it. It just means that when you use something like conservative and economic, to be really, really careful. Because they don't mean all the same things. Another thing, morals, conservative. What does it mean, conservative standard? God created the world. So God has some idea of how we ought to act. One standard. The opposite to that. There is no God. So we can all decide on what we ought to do. There's no standard of morality. Now, it's funny, it depends on what you want to do, which side you want to be on, right? If you want to be able to, you know, sleep around or do this or do that, you say, well, I don't know, it's up to whatever I want to. So I, I'm on the liberal morality. And then if somebody says, well, you know what, I think we should all vote to kill all red-headed people. Because if there's no standard, isn't that perfectly just? Or how about this? Why don't we all vote to kill all the Jews? Suddenly not so crazy, right? The Germans voted Hitler in. He didn't take over. If you have no standard, you could support anything, right? Now, I know we don't think about that. We think, well, I, it's me, freedom, I want to be able to do whatever I want to do. But th that's your argument. If you really believe that there's no moral standard, that means there is no moral standard. So even the things that you don't like are acceptable. The funny thing is that most people in modern today, because we have pornography and all sorts of naughty stuff all over everyone, they kind of put themselves on this side because they don't really test it. You know some of the most intolerant meetings I've ever been to? You can guess. The most intolerant meetings I've been to are meetings about tolerance. That's ironic. But isn't it? Because what's the whole point about these kind of tolerance things? What are you saying? If you don't allow everything, you are a bigot, sexist, homophobe, whatever. Am I wrong on this? Isn't that, and you get in there, if you, you say, well, you know, I'm definitely for racial equality. I don't know if I support gay marriage. Then you should be thrown away. The level of intolerance is extremely high. Go ahead. Does this kind of also go with what we talk about with the film, the baby boomers? Totally. Okay. Absolutely. And, but this is before. This, what well, we're talking about right now is a little bit before, right? Well, this is actually the baby boomer thing. Okay. What was ironic is no one debated this, really. I shouldn't say that. The French Revolution debated this a great deal. That's why they invented the guillotine to chop people's head off, because they said, you don't agree with me, you, we're going to catch you up. If you really think about it, if there's no standard, then how do you establish any standards? You vote on it. So what about the people that don't agree with you? There's no standard, right? So is there anything wrong just getting rid of them? That's where you get the head chopping off. Hitler, do you think he's a religious guy or a totally non-religious guy? 
totally non. I mean, the exact opposite of non. He thought of himself as a scientist. Religion was something that people used to make other people weak. Compassion is something that you, you give to somebody else to, to try to let the strong be handicapped. Totally non-religious. Yes? Was, was it Hitler who like uh, followed Nietzsche? That's, that's exactly right. Nietzsche. Who's Nietzsche? Uh, there was no God. There's no God, right? And that religion was used in order to prevent the strong from being stronger. It's, it, it's kind of like a conspiracy created by weak people in order to protect themselves. And if you think about it, because what does religion say? You should help the needy. poor, the needy. It's a follow big conspiracy. So if you just wipe that out, then the, the needy just fall off to the side, and the strong survive. And the strong should always win, right? This is Nietzsche's argument, and this is totally Hitler's argument. My big point here, there is no unification. There is no unity in Europe. And so when we talk about Europe, you have to realize that they're totally different sides. Most folks were on the one standard side in the 1800s, most of the 1900s. In terms of economics, most were somewhere on this side. England was closer to this side. The United States was over on this side. Most of Europe was probably on this side. Politically, most of Europe is going to be on this side. The United States was here. You need to get this in order to get this whole point about different trends. Does that make sense? Okay. Question. Should you know these things? Yeah, you should. Is so I, it? I always assume the world and kind of the same. They are today. But it's a changeable term. Okay. Why do they change? I'm sorry. It's just one of those things. Well, how about this? Greater and lesser. What does it mean to be greater or lesser? It depends, right? So it's a changing term, and that's all it means. You keep it the same, or you want to change. But it depends on what it is right now that will determine what that means. Super quick.